Hey, welcome to 12 Tone. Hallelujah by Leonard Cohen is in C major. <clears throat> Sorry, had something in my throat. Let me try that again. Hallelujah by Leonard Cohen is in C major. The harmony relies almost exclusively on C, A minor, F, and G, the four most fundamental chords in that key, and the melody ultimately resolves to that note. This isn't difficult, even Google agrees with me. And yet, I can't shake the feeling it's a bit more complicated than that. In fact, I'm not even sure Hallelujah is in a key. Let me explain. This video is sponsored by Skillshare. Now, when I say hallelujah isn't in a key, I don't mean it's some atonal serialist nightmare full of clashing chords and random notes. In fact, it's quite the opposite. I'm pretty sure hallelujah is in two different keys at the same time. Now, this on its own is not unheard of. Playing in multiple keys simultaneously is called polytonality, and it usually sounds kinda like this. That's an excerpt from Stravinsky's Petrushka, and it's in C major and F sharp major simultaneously. It sounds interesting, but it's pretty rough to listen to. Even less aggressive examples of polytonality, like Ives' Psalm 67, still have this lingering, unsettled feeling to them, like we're not quite sure where we're supposed to land. But Hallelujah doesn't really do that. Polytonality makes it so that no single chord can really provide a complete sense of resolution. Hallelujah, on the other hand, goes the other direction, allowing multiple different chords to feel completely resolved. And that is, again, unsurprising. We can accomplish that pretty easily through modulation or changing keys. If I play this... It pretty quickly establishes C as our point of resolution. But then if I do some sneaky things with the chords... Suddenly we're resolving to G. That's two different points of resolution. Simple, right? But it's still not the same thing. Once we've resolved to G, we've left C. It doesn't feel like our root anymore. We're in two different keys, but not at the same time. No, what Hallelujah does is a little more complicated than that. In my opinion, Hallelujah uses what Dr. Robert Bailey calls a double tonic complex. That is, it blends two different keys, but instead of fighting each other like in traditional polytonality, they overlap and support each other, combining into one single mega key that just happens to have multiple roots. Structurally, I'd break this song's chord progression into five main sections. It all starts like this, going back and forth between C major and A minor. These are gonna be our two keys going forward. No matter which one is the correct root, though, both of them are stable. This is either one and six minor, or it's one minor and flat three. C is probably a bit more likely, since it's the first chord and we tend to hear things in major until we find a good reason not to, but in both cases, we'd expect there to be very little harmonic motion, so it doesn't super matter which one is right. At least, not yet. From there, we get this which is a lot more definitive. We're going 4-5-1 in C, then reinforcing it with another 5-1. Going from 5 to 1 is the strongest sense of resolution you can get in a key, and here they do it twice in a row. We can label these chords in A minor if we want, but it's a much less compelling analysis. We're pretty obviously in C, just like Google said we were. But, well, let's look at the third section. Here we get that same F, G, but instead of going to C again, we get A minor. Now, this can be explained in C. It's what's called a deceptive cadence, where you set up a resolution from 5 to 1, but then instead of actually going to 1, you faint away and end up somewhere else, usually 6 minor. That's a perfectly valid analysis, but this can also be read as flat 6, flat 7, 1 in A, which is a fairly common resolution in natural minor progressions. Much like the first section, these two analyses agree on the basic shape, but this time they have slightly different implications. Then we get this where, again, we see F and G going to A minor, but this time they get interrupted by E major. And again, if we really try, we can explain this in C. It's what's called a secondary dominant, which is just when you borrow the V chord from another key in order to temporarily point at that key's root. Effectively, the idea is that A minor is still the sixth chord, but we want to really highlight it, so we use E major to set it up. But if that's what's happening, how do we explain the F and G? What are they doing there? We can't really call it a deceptive cadence anymore. The deceptive cadence is a harmonic fakeout, a musical blow that sets you up for a strong resolution and then surprises you with a weaker one. It's a sneaky move, but the secondary dominant is anything but sneaky. The two analyses disagree. The secondary dominant implies strength, while the deceptive cadence demands weakness. If we smash them together, the end result is... 
confusing. But when I listen to this section, I'm not confused. It makes perfect sense to me because I'm hearing it in A minor. In that key, all these different pieces align. The F and G are still doing that same walk-up, building tension to a resolution. This isn't a weak or sneaky thing, it's the strongest resolution available in natural minor. The E, meanwhile, isn't a borrowed 5 chord pointing somewhere unusual, it's the actual 5 chord and it points back home. Technically, there's no 5 major in a minor key, but it's such a common substitution that it's basically an honorary member of the tonality. It requires no special explanation if we're in A. In this context, the walk-up and the E chord don't clash. Instead, the E chord amplifies the tension of the walk-up, all of which is pointing in the exact same direction. And finally, we have the chorus. Here we use F as a pivot, first going back to A minor, then to C. These five sections have five different relationships with their keys. In the first, we have a sort of soft ambiguity. There's not enough information to really determine the root. In the second, we strongly establish C major. In the third, it's ambiguous again, but this time it's a hard ambiguity. Whereas before we were missing information, here we've got contradictory information with a heavily implied resolution that gets subverted. The fourth section strongly establishes A minor, and then finally the chorus synthesizes the two keys, presenting them as two equally valid destinations within the same harmonic framework. So we're going back and forth between two keys, right? Well, not quite. If we look at the parts where a single root is clearly established, we see that none of those sections contain the other one chord at all. This means that every time we hear C major and every time we hear A minor, it's always at least plausibly the root. Neither of them is ever used in a way that implies further motion. They're both completely resolved every time. This raises an intriguing possibility. Maybe we're not actually shifting back and forth between them at all. Maybe they're just both the root all the time. But does that work? Are we allowed to do that? I mean, yeah, we're music theorists. We're allowed to do whatever we want as long as we can justify it. And that's where the double tonic complex comes in because Hallelujah is far from the only song that does this. Bailey originally developed the concept to explain the work of late romantic composers like Wagner and Mahler, but later theorists like Dr. Drew Nobile have applied it to all sorts of rock and pop songs, including Private Eyes by Hall & Oates, What's Love Got To Do With It by Tina Turner, and Party Rock Anthem by LMFAO. God, remember LMFAO? Now that was art music. But how does it work? How can we be in two keys at the same time without conflict? Well, so far I've been describing describing it as ambiguous, but that's not quite right. Ambiguity implies confusion. It implies that we're looking for the root and not finding it, but that's not really what Hallelujah is like. I'm never unsure where the root is, I'm just finding more one chords than I'd expect. The key isn't ambiguous, it's flexible. We can compare this to linguistic ambiguity. If I say the club is on fire, that's ambiguous. There could be a lot of people having a great time, or there could be arson, but it's probably not both. You have to choose which of these two fundamentally incompatible things I'm trying to say and without additional context, I just have to hope you guessed right, or you might show up to a party at a burning building. On the other hand, consider the sentence, I have two pets. This isn't ambiguous. There's really only one thing I could mean by it, but it's flexible because there's missing information. If I wanted to be more precise, I could say I have two cats, which I do, but you don't need that context. You already knew what I meant. When we talk about keys, we tend to do it at one specific level of precision. Hallelujah is in A minor, or it's in C. But we don't have to do that. Maybe A minor is a cat and C major is a dog, but as long as we can bring them together into one unified concept of pets... This analogy is spiraling out of control, but you get my point. If we can make them behave like one coherent tonality, we don't need to know or care which one wins. That's why most songs that use a double tonic complex have the same pair of one chords. You've got a major triad, which in Hallelujah is C, and then a minor triad built on its sixth note, in this case a minor. These two keys have what's called a relative relationship. Normally, I say this means they have all the same notes, they just use them differently, but honestly, they're barely even different. Most of the notes and chords behave roughly the same way in both keys. Like, consider D minor. This is the four chord in A, which tends to have an unstable directionless sound. In C, though, it's the two chord, which is also unstable and directionless. Two and four are pretty interchangeable. Or for another example, let's look at G. This is five in C, which resolves to one, but as we saw in the walk-up, G can also resolve just fine to A minor. Same chord, same function. This means progressions written in one key will behave roughly the same way in the other, as long as we swap in the correct one chord. We saw this pretty clearly in Hallelujah, where it went F, G, C, and then did the exact same thing, but swapped in A minor instead. There's only one real difference between them, which chord they use as their ultimate point of resolution. If it's C, we're in C. If it's A minor, 
we're in A minor. Music theorists call this point of resolution the tonic, but in a double tonic complex, it's a bit harder to define. There's a couple ways of thinking about this. Dr. Nobile would argue that Hallelujah's tonic is this set of four notes. It's the combination of our two one chords. We've got A minor here and C major here. Depending on the bass, this collection could be A minor 7 or C major 6, both of which are common stable chords. And this argument makes plenty of sense. Many songs with double tonic complexes will use this full collection at climactic moments to really emphasize their entire key. But for the most part, rock and pop are based on triads, not seventh chords, so I prefer to think about it in the other direction. Instead of using the combination of the two chords, I think of the tonic as the overlap between them. In Hallelujah, that's the dyad C and E, with G and A both serving as valid extensions. And that's why Hallelujah is such a good example. Up to now, we've just been talking about chords, but I think it's time to consider the melody. It starts like this. Your faith was strong going back and forth between G and A are two tonic extensions. This highlights the double tonic nature of the progression, playing around in the space between our two keys. From there, we get this big dramatic rise before ending with this. Hallelujah. A walk from E down to C, our tonic dyad, creating a rock solid finish that sounds resolved in both keys at the same time. Because they rely on the overlap between the two keys, songs with double tonic complexes tend to stick to fairly simple chords that work well in that overlap. From the perspective of the major Root, the five most common chords are the 1, 2 minor, 4, 5, and 6 minor. These chords all have fairly consistent relationships with the tonic dyad regardless of which form it takes, so we can use them without clearly establishing one key or the other. That's not to say these are the only chords you can use. Sometimes you get an extra chord for spice, like Hallelujah's E major, but leaning on these five chords is the best way to create the harmonic flexibility you need in order to sustain a double tonic complex. One area where these complexes are especially common is in chord loops, which Come on, y'all knew I was going to talk about chord loops eventually, right? Gotta stay on brand. In fact, the double tonic complex is a great way to understand one of the most famous chord loops of all time, the axis progression. I did a whole video about this, link in the description, so I won't spend too much time here, but when theorists talk about this progression, we often focus on its ambiguity. It's easy to stabilize on both C and A minor. Typically, we'll just treat the first chord played as the one chord, or we'll go digging around in the melody for clues, but the double tonic complex presents a compelling alternative. Maybe it's just both. All the chords in this progression come from that list we made earlier. Is it really so hard to imagine that we're hearing two tonics? And this also explains something that came up in my Plagal Cascade video, link in the description. The Plagal Cascade is another common chord loop. And just like the axis progression, we can stabilize on two different points, in this case A minor and G, but we don't get that same sense of uncertainty. The axis progression can create a space where both chords feel like the tonic, but the plagal cascade can't. The two interpretations are incompatible, so once you hear one, it's really hard to find the other. In my original video, I said this was because the two one chords are unstable points in each other's keys, and that's basically right, but the double tonic complex gives us the language to explain this a bit more precisely. A minor and G don't have an overlap for the complex to explore. The tonal relationship isn't flexible. And then there's Sweet Home Alabama. Adam Neely made a whole video on this, and I've mentioned it a couple times as well, but for some reason, whenever music theorists find a new way to think about keys, we always like to test it out on this song. The chord progression goes like this. To me, that looks like 5, 4, 1, and G, which is also the chord they spend the most time on. The melody, though... Can me home, see my kin is built on a walk down from 3 to 1 in D. This gives us two possible keys, G major and D mixolydian, basically D major with a flat 7. Theorists and performers have been arguing over which one is correct since before the song was released. In his memoir, Backstage Passes and Backstabbing Bastards, Al Cooper, the producer, tells the story of how he tried to correct guitarist Ed King in the recording session because he thought he was soloing in the wrong key. Now, in his paper, Dr. Nobile says that because these two keys aren't relative major and minor, this isn't an example of a double tonic complex, and I get where he's coming from, but I disagree. Instead, I'd say it is a double tonic complex, it's just a bit more rigid. After all, G major and D mixolydian do use all the same notes. The difference, though, is that they don't share a lot of chord functions, which would be a problem if this wasn't a loop. You see, chord functions are based on the idea of harmony as a journey. You play a series of chords with specific behaviors in a specific order, and those chords eventually deliver you to a final conclusion. That's the harmonic philosophy behind Hallelujah, so in that case, the chord functions matter. But loops aren't like that. In a loop, you're working with harmony not as a journey, 
journey, but as a location. A chord loop is a self-contained, self-establishing tonal unit, and it plays by a different set of rules. In a chord loop, the only thing that matters is the specific chords we're actually using, and if we look at G and D in isolation, we see they do actually overlap. They both contain the note D, and wouldn't you know it, that's where the melody keeps resolving to. People tend to use the melody as evidence that the D chord is the tonic, but much like we reduced Hallelujah's C major and A minor down to a single tonic dyad, we can reduce Sweet Home Alabama's two keys to just a single tonic note. This is especially compelling because, metrically speaking, those resolutions to D set up the G chord. We have to be careful which other chords we use, but fortunately, C major does have roughly the same function in both keys, so it works as a pivot. I think this analysis does a better job capturing the experience of listening to the song. To Myers, at least, it's pretty easy to switch back and forth between the two keys. I can convince myself of either one, and the double tonic complex helps explain why. But this isn't about Sweet Home Alabama, it's about Hallelujah, so let's come back to our initial question. What key is Hallelujah in? It's in C major. And it's in A minor. But really, honestly, it's in the massive overlap between them. One thing about being a moderately successful YouTuber is that I get a lot of people asking for advice on how to do YouTube, and I always try to help where I can, but honestly, I have no idea what I'm doing. Fortunately, one of YouTube's all-time greats, Marquez Brownlee, recently released a course on Skillshare that's all about that, so if you've ever considered making your own channel, Marquez's course is an amazing resource. He covers everything from scripting, to shooting, to editing, to using YouTube's backend tools to learn and grow your channel. It's a really comprehensive look at what it takes to do this seriously, and it's just one of thousands of amazing courses on Skillshare, covering things like audio engineering, songwriting, graphic design, and cooking. If that sounds cool, they're even offering 30% off an annual premium membership to the first 1,000 12-tone viewers to click the link in the description. And that goes for new and existing members. Even if you already did a free trial, you can still click the link for a pretty sweet discount. And hey, thanks for watching, and extra special thanks to this video's featured patrons, Duck and Howard Levine. If you want to help out and help us pick the next song we analyze too, there's a link to our Patreon on screen now. Oh, and don't forget to like, share, comment, subscribe, and above all, keep on rocking.